so <laughs> welcome to the second part <laughs> so uh, okay so this part will start so in the last presentations we have basically we have break application schema in two big new tools one of them is the smart data loader the other one is the features templating so we have saw the smart data loader in the first presentations and now we'll have a look at the feature templating so the smart data loader allow us to read from a database data store actually may not necessarily be a database read the domain model and put it to us efficiently in a nice way as a stream of features that can then be queried by the ogc services or ogc apis now we'll see how we can customize the output we want to obtain based on that stream of features so this is done with a new extension in GeoServer. This one has actually been around for uh, half a year now. It was initially done. We in, it was actually done in financial. Sorry, it was done in partnership and financed by BRGM. Initially, it had support for JSON LD, and during the API for Inspire study, we added support for the GeoJSON output format. So it's a free as an open source extensions of your server. And the single most important aspect of it is that now we don't do the mapping having to worry about the, okay, I will need to do a join. I will need to have a feature shining here. I will need to do this or that because I have this limitation on the schema on the database is what you see is what you get approach. So we take the output format that we want to obtain and we put plus holders from the values of the domains we want to see. Okay, so obviously this is integrated with OGC features and WFS service and basically any service in your server. It, sorry, right now is integrated with both of those and in the future it may be integrated with other services from your server that produce actually features, not raster data. And obviously this is also quite efficient because it acts on any memory features uh, basically that are available as they are read and built from the database by the smart data loader tool. Okay, so the important aspect here is that we'll have a mapping and the mapping will have directives. So we'll be able to reference properties. So, okay, this is the GeoJSON I want to obtain. This is the XML I want to obtain. And these are the properties that I want to see here. Then it will be the job of the computer, in this case, your server, to understand that template and manage all the querying, all the translation on the fly. But as a user, we just have to worry about this is my output format. This is the values I want to reference. I, we may apply transformations on the fly, filtering on the fly. This will become later with some concrete example and also some user parameterization. A typical use case for this, I want to see a different language based on the user. I want to trim out, prune out part of the data because it will make it too heavy to load. And uh, there is some also content negotiating happening, obviously. So we define a mapping for a certain output format. Right now, these are the supported one, JSON-LD, GeoJSON. This is the format of the OGC API features and JSON and obviously GML. Actually, we don't support uh, currently GML. This slide is wrong. Only JSON-LD, GeoJSON, and JSON are supported. GML is from a next step. I will discuss that later in more details. Okay, so I will jump directly to the concrete uh, example. So we have uh, a few directives. We have four directives that are fundamental. One of them is the ability to say, look, I want this property. I want to apply a transformation. So using my property, I want to concatenate it with another thing. That's a transformation. I want to filter the content. So only encode this part of the output if this condi condition is true. And we end up parameterization. So if the user provide a prefix, use the user provide use the user provided prefix or use this one as default. Okay, again, we'll use that very oversimplified use case. So is the stations use case. Remember, we have stations that contains observation that links to a parameter. Okay, this is the default output we obtain after the smart data loader tool has done its job. And this is the default GeoJSON output, okay? 
they look pretty much like this. So we have a station, a station will contain a list of observation and each observation will link to a parameter, define it, what the measured valid was. And we can see the same thing on GeoJSON. So we have uh, a station, that station has an array of observations and each observations will reference a parameter. So this again with some coloring. So we have here the identification of the station. So we have its location, geometry, we have its ID, its code, its common name. And then we have the list of observations. And for each observation, we have an ID, a timestamp, the value, and then the metadata about the value. So this is an observation that was done at this timestamp at 35 temperature, so 35 Celsius degrees. And here, a similar entry, but for the wind speed measured at this time. And now this is actually what our data modeling team come up with that should be the output format. Okay, so it's more compact, compact uh, sorry, more compact and more readable and directly usable. So we want to concatenate the code should be built using the station prefix and the, co the, the code of the of the of the stations. The, the location should also be included as a WKT string and the observations we want directly to see the value with the right unit. So basically we get rid of one nested level. Okay, this is the output format we want. Okay, this is how it's done. We define a template like this. So we take our output format and we just replace with the properties we want to obtain. So these are the, the, or the main model. We have stations, oops, sorry. We have stations, observations, parameters, a station as an ID, a code, the name, a position. Here we go. We can have a list of stations. We have an ID. So the idea here in this slide is just to show that your reference attributes of our domain, okay? When we go to the next slide, now we can see them side by side. So this is my template and this is the output I want to obtain. So we have a list of stations. Here we go. We have an array of stations. So this is the directive. I say that my source is the stations entity. I have a list of observations. So my source is the observations and I will have a list of them. And then we map each, uh, each entry of it. Okay, so my ID will be the value of the ID column. The positions will be the value of my position column. The name is the common name. Here, I want to do a transformation. So I want to concatenate the code with the prefix station. And for the geometry here, I want also it encoded as WKT for some integration reason, we don't know. And then comes the observations. For the observations, I say, and this is where things become quite interesting. So. I don't have any more to worry about. I need to do a join. What's the foreign key on the database? What the primary key? I just say, look, starting from the, uh, the observation, I want to reference its time. I want to reference its value. And I want to reference the parameter unit associated to this observation. And I want to say that exactly the same for the name. So here we have the time spent directly from the observations table, the value, which is a concatenation between the value of the observation and the parameter unit that you obtain from the parameter that is related with this observation, okay? And that's it, we obtain this output. Obviously, here the features templating will do quite a, a, a complex work to translate all of this correctly and to retrieve the necessary data from the database and build the correct uh, complex features, okay? Here is the deal. For budget reasons, we didn't add the time, the budget, basically to add the actually support to reference the domain properties directly. So that's why in the demos you will do, you will actually see the X parts of the internal scheme. Both will be supported, but we just didn't add the budget to implement this aspect of it. So basically this is how it will look like. So when we reference the in-memory complex feature, instead of referencing directly the domain model, for the moment, we still need to reference it using a more or less XML language. Something that will be fixed soon, hopefully, but still, just wanted to make that clear before you go to the real demos. Okay, so here we go. Now I'm going to go to GeoServer. 
there is my colleague Marco behind the scenes that will be configuring the templates as we move. So there is no magic. <laughs> He's in doing the background work. Okay. So let me go to the layer preview. We configured the meteor stations. I'm going to obtain the GeoJSON representation of it. There we go. And this is my Marco. You can switch the template in the meantime. Okay. So this is the default representations I obtain from the from the smart data loader work. Okay. So we have a stations. We have a list of observations, and each observation references a parameter. Now we have loaded up this template. We want things to be a lot more compact. So basically, we say, look. I will have a list of stations uh, and I will have a list of observations and I want to concatenate the parameters directly. Okay, if my colleague was able to switch the template, I'm going now to request again the GeoJSON and he was not. Ah, no, it was actually, sorry, <laughs> was a bit lost. There we go. So this is the original one, and this is with the template applied. So here we can see that for the same station, so stations number set seven, actually, we can see that the code is now concatenated. We can see the duplicate encoding of the geometry, and we can see the list of observations in a much more readable and compacted way. So this is for a this is for the very simple uh, template. The other important aspect of this is that the feature templatings will allow also allow us to directly query the output format, obviously using the structure of the output format. So, and this is obviously compatible with WFS and OGC API. So for example, here I'm saying, look, give me all the features, all the stations that have the name Bologna. And if I look at the structure, I will see that we have okay features, properties, and the name of the station I want. So when I click on it, here we go, I obtain the Bologna station. The same thing here for a more complex one, where I say that the observation type needs to be temperature. Okay. When I open it, when we pretty print, we see that it retrieves all the stations that have a measurement for temperature. So this, well, how complex this is happening behind the scenes. So where here in the template, we just say, look, each observations will contain values from the observations table and from the parameter. And then we define the template where both of them are integrated together. And your server is able to sort all of this out, build an SQL query, send it to the database and efficiently retrieve the data we need. This will get even more complex because, well, obviously, let me just show the example with OGC Features API. We can see the same Bologna, but we can also see the meta links mandated by the, the specification. And the same for the complex one. Okay, both have the temperature and both have the temperature measurements. Okay, I need to click like this and click on present. Okay. Okay. So now there is another uh, another directory that I mentioned was the filtering directory. So the ability of filtering the content of the output format on the fly. So let's say that instead of having a single array containing all the measurements, I mean we have an application that only cares about temperature or pressures. So instead of retrieving all that data and I have to pay that cost, we basically will allow to define on the template, look, don't give me, don't give me the, don't give me the temperatures and the pressures unless I ask for this. But first, and this means that we need the ability that on the format to actually say, okay, I have this stream of data and I have these nested entities, but for that root entity, this nested entity should go in this place if they match this condition, they should go in that place if they match these conditions. Marco, can you configure the template? Thank you. So uh, this is what this template will look like. Okay, let me show a bit the colorful one. 
So this is what we want to obtain. We want to take those observations and we want to obtain nested arrays that contain only temperatures, that contain only pressures, that contain only wind speeds, whatever. And this will be done like this. So in the source, which defines where we'll read the data from, we'll say, look, unless the parameter name is temperature, or, or, or let me rephrase it, it only include in this subarray, okay, the, the observations that have a parameter that is of the type temperature and here of the type pressure. So the full template will look like this. So we have an array for temperatures an array for pressures and from wind speed. And we can see, forget about this and yes for the moment, I will explain it later. And we can see that here we say, okay, only include here the nested objects that are of the type temperature, the type pressure and the type wind speed. And now if I go to GeoServer, and actually I can click directly here. This is with WFS, here we go we can see that I obtain, well, let me copy it. It's better to display it there. There we go. So we can see now that I have my observations organized by types. I have temperatures, I have pressures, and I have the wind speeds. This for every stations. For example, this station doesn't have anything, so nothing is encoded. Okay. So now what makes this more interesting is, remember, we only care about the output format because we have completely separated the concern. So if the output format now has an array with temperatures, then I can query directly on it. So I want here, for example, all the stations that have a temperature measurement of 20 degrees. And if I click on this, I will obtain this station, which has a temperature management of 20. If I think there is one of 35, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, here we go. We obtain one with a temperature measurement of 35. If I provide a value that doesn't exist, hopefully this will not return anything. Okay, so all of this is integrated together. And the last but not the least directory is the user parameterization. So this is based, I mean, if you ever have used SLD, there is already this concept of, of user provided parameters where basically in the template, we can say, look, this value by default will use, in this case, for example, yes. But if the user provide this on the query, so this query parameter, we'll use whatever he provided here. So basically what we say here is, look, only encode the temperatures array if the user wants to show the temperature. By default, we show everything. And if the user says otherwise, we'll only show what he requested for. This is useful to pruning uh, the content to not basically spend traffic on all the things we actually don't need. If we go to the querying, we can see here an example query where we say in the event, look, show temperatures, no, show pressure is no. This is for WFS and the same query for the OGC API features. So if we query it, we'll see that only the wind speeds are encoded and all the other aspect of the output format were pruned out. Okay, so one more. So another aspect was, okay, here, again, we have separated the concerns, so we are only interacted on the output format. And we can say things like, look, I, I want to completely rearrange output model from some a general rule. One typical rule, such rule, is the flat output. I have a nested object, but because I need to integrate this with a system that cannot read nested object, I can only read, well, simple attributes, then we just ask the system to flat it out. And so the output we'll obtain will look like this. So this is done basically with a vendor option on the template where we say, actually here we integrate these vendor options with a user parameterization. So the user when requesting either through WFS or OGC API, he can request flat output yes or false, by default is false, using this separator to separate the nested uh, entries. So this request will look a bit like this. If here we provide them flat output true, and we can say that we obtain the flatter outed output. 
if I come here and I say set this to false, raw data, there we go, I have the nested objects. And obviously, this is integrated also with the OGC features API. Okay, I'm speeding a bit because we're running out of time. I want to show some real use cases because this was a very oversimplified use case. So one of them is the a use case that is the environment monitoring facility where actually this data is a simple feature, but remember we are only added on in-memory features. So if they are complex or simple, we just don't care. We just want to be able to reference their properties. It's another level of abstraction. So this is an in interesting use case where you actually start from, a, okay, this one is actually quite big. So we start from a simple table and we want to obtain something like this. So I can show you the template. So you can see our real template looks like. There we go. So this is what the real use case will look like in practice. So we say explicitly, okay, yes, I want the geometry in a specific format, concatenated. I want this property from my complex feature, blah, 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 blah. So we have total full control to put things where we want. If I wish, I could just come here and add a new property. And as long as it makes sense in this context, it will be used. Okay, in this case, we also defined the JSON-LD encoding. So there will be some content negotiation done by your server and it will use the JSON-LD templating for the JSON-LD uh, MIME type. I can demo this right now using the JSON-LD. And there we go. We obtain a completely different output based on JSON LD. So we have our context and we have our features encoded, encoded according to the template as defined here. This was another example. The other example I wanted to show was the initiative uh, example. So if we go to our JSON output, okay, we can copy it. Let me put it here. Here we go. So we see that we have a more, more, much more compacted representations that we were obtained from the from the from the smart data loader tool. Okay. Here we go. So basically, we don't want to see so much nesting. We want a much more compacted representation, and that's exactly what we obtain. I don't think it's worth going to the details of this of each. Uh, let's say of each mapping. The important here is that, well, we have real cases that are handled by this and we can see that indeed we have full control over them. Okay, moving forward because we're running out of time. There we go. Okay, in terms of next steps, uh, we want to add support for XML templating and that XML templating will allow us to support GML and HTML. HTML will also be a game changer because it means that every deployment will be able to provide a default representations for that complex features and for something like OGC API features will be quite interesting because when you obtain an output, you'll have the meta links and one of those meta links will be to an HTML representation where you can see your output directly. Uh, okay, that's another aspect. Ability to use domain model entities and attributes. So right now, as I mentioned, we can we still have to reference the X part of the internal model. That's a budget limitation, but that's something we really like to support is the ability to defend the domain model. We we'll want to have a, a new UI in REST API to configure the templates like we configure styles on your server, and this allow, allow us to more fine grained control of the content negotiation where we can see if I don't know the request as this HTTP header, then use this specific template. We like to have the possibility to mix templates together where we say, look, this is how I represent one of my features in JSON. Then if I am using JSON LD, I introduce the context and I include that representation. It may or may not work, it's just an example. For example, if I have multiple as a condition, if I have multiple features, I will include an array. If I don't have multiple features, I will include one single representation outside an array. As usual, 
this will be driven what, what will be able to implement will be driven by the community and when they funded we get on this this features templating was mostly financed by BRGM and we implemented the GeoJSON templating uh, in the context of the API for Inspire project. And that's all I have to say about this topic. If you have any questions, I already saw one. How can they be integrated? Okay, that's an excellent question. So at this moment, there is no uh, concrete implementation of WPS that supports this, but that's something that can definitely be, be done will not be a major task. I mean, to, to the processing service request, if somebody needs this, please have it implemented. That's how we got the templating today. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good summary. <laughs> Thank you, Cathy. Just, just making this clear point that this is not stuff that appears by magic. This is stuff where yes. we have managed to find the budget and get this done because we saw this needs to be done. And um, there are more bits out there, but we can't get the budget for everything. Yeah, this was actually quite tight. There was a significant investment from Geo Solutions in getting this done. And now let's see the interest from the community. And as you say, well, Cat, unless there is funding, uh, not much will be done. There is already some stuff being discussed. So for further questions. Ask now, otherwise the session will soon be over and you won't be able to ask anymore. It looks there are no further questions in the in the chat box. At least I'm not, uh, I couldn't uh, spot them. So I'm assuming that either we've answered all questions or we have so thoroughly confused everybody that they no longer dare ask. <laughs> I very much hope it's the first. If it's the second and, and you wake up tonight screaming with a good question, send it to us per mail and we will try and circulate the answer. If not, I'm assuming that everybody has understood everything we've told them most people will be downloading this new functionality the moment it becomes publicly available and then we will see how the uptake is. Nuno, anything else on your side or also Severa who's been one of the driving forces behind this? Anything you want to add? I'm good. I said everything I wanted to say. Uh, we have another one, uh, database, I'll uh, check the, the, the chat, Nuno, you can answer that better than I can. Our database index, yes, so th that's the difficult part. So can you hear me? Yes, yep. I'm not muted. Maybe just yeah. to read the question for the recording. So are database index used in SQL's filter when composing the output? The, the answer is yes, because otherwise it will be really slow. So that's the difficult part is that both the features templating and smart data loader, they need to understand the query and then they need to translate it to the original uh, data stored query model. And in this case, it will be an SQL query. Good question. I mean, it's, it's generally advisable to make sure that the database you have behind this is running efficiently and you have all of your indexes there. Sivar, you wanted to provide feedback. If you unmute yourself, you might hear it. Simon, can he unmute himself? Sorry? Can can Sivir un unmute himself? No, I can, I can, I, I can okay. press a button. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, so we're good. Uh, yeah, that's more an overall feedback. Um, the first thing we funded here was the, the templating side. And for those who are who have running to a server with app schema, that's already really handy uh, because Without touching the app schema account, it allows us to to drive uh, the structure we want for our JSON and JSONL the output, which is really convenient not to multiply it. all the open source solutions to generate all those uh, other uh, serializations. Um, the smart app data loader is uh, progressively proving to be a game changer, at least internally, using the RGM and also promoting this a bit in France. Uh, to help really lower the the entry knowledge entry ticket. 
for uh, GIS colleagues that are kind of scared, um, yeah, doing XML accounts. So it's really worth to try and um, yeah, join us in making this evolve. <laughs> Otherwise, if there are no further comments, I would thank you all for your time and attention. Recordings of this, this session will all be made available. And uh, Nuno, will you also be um, making your presentations available as PDF? Yes, sure. I will provide them to you and then feel free to share them as you wish. And, and, and Simon, can probably, you make them available? Could, maybe, Kathy, if you can make uh, publish the first, last slides, uh, maybe because we have also some announcement uh, to make. Could, could you repeat that? Could you please share your slide deck, please, once again, uh, ah. the last slides, because we have some announcements uh, still. OK. Oh, oh that, 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 that's what you wanted me to share. OK, I, I, I thought you meant sharing as in sending. Um, you meant sharing as in putting the last slide on. So the one with the, with the announcement, yes. As, as Kati mentioned already, so the recording and all the slides will be available on the join up site. Uh, so you will be, all that have been registered, you will receive an email with all the, all the details. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, so this, uh, this webinar, this workshop today was a part of the API for Inspire or the, the, the activity facilitating access to Inspire data through the APIs. Um, before I will give a floor as well to Marco Mingini to, to give some closing words on that activity. I would just like to make the announcement for the next uh, webinar that is uh, that we are preparing in the one week time. So next Thursday at two o'clock, uh, we'll be there with the blockchain and proof of location supporting digital government. There is already a registration link available. And uh, as, uh, on the next slide uh, is uh, a thank you to you. And please, Marco, if you can close, uh, give some closing words uh, at this point. Thanks a lot, uh, Simon. Yes, just uh, to close uh, uh, the uh, very interesting webinar with some uh, words about the API for Inspire project that uh, is almost uh, over and it's been a project of uh, one year, um, more or less. Uh, the purpose of that project was more in general to investigate the uh, implications of implementing these new standard-based APIs, in particular OGC API features that we have seen today and also sense OGC Sensor Things API. Um, uh, for those who don't know, those two um, uh, standards have been uh, recently um, endorsed by the Inspire Maintenance and Implementation Group, the Inspire MIG, as uh, um, Inspire Download Services. So this means it's, uh, it's now possible to actually provide uh, Inspire data sets, static data sets, dynamic data sets using those two um, uh, standards. Um, uh, this is possible through the recent mechanism of Inspire Good Practices. So we now have Inspire Good Practices. Many more can, can follow up on this. Uh, I'm just thinking to OGC API maps or OGC API records or something that is the OGC is cooking um, at the moment. Um, so that project in general has been, uh, I would say, a milestone uh, in this process that is a more general process of, uh, in a way, modernizing the Inspire um, uh, infrastructure, um, which is a pillar of the new Inspire maintenance and implementation work uh, program. Uh, so thanks uh, uh, again to uh, DataCove uh, Geosolutions and also from Nofer that were involved um, uh, in this project. The last but not least, of course, uh, I, I'm sure you are all uh, interested in the project. So uh, there is a, a very nice website uh, that was set up where all the material, all the results are collected. And these include uh, uh, slides, links to the workshops, first of all. And I recommend you also to uh, go back to the one on uh, OGC Sensor Things API that was held in November. But also uh, there is a description of the great API implementations done with the, with the data providers involved. Plus, of course, a step-by-step -step guide on how to actually implement or use um, uh, the uh, the the standard. So um, maybe I can paste it in the chat uh, again, um, but this is really uh, a suggestion. And with that, of course, thanks to Kathy and Nuno for the uh, brilliant workshop um, today. And thanks to you all for your participation and your input.